Greetings. This is going to be fire part 13. This should be the conclusion of this series. Turn your Bible to John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. I guess we're going to read the whole thing. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. And a husbandman referring to a, uh, like a vine or a vineyard, was somebody that prunes and takes care of the vineyard, gathers the fruit. Verse 2, Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So I guess having fruit is pretty important, huh? And they're, it's talking about our works, okay? Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, when you got a, a let's say a fruit tree, and you got a branch that no longer bears the fruit, thing is, you cut it back, and instead of having one branch that doesn't bear fruit, sometimes you'll get two or three branches growing out of that cut, that do bear fruit. So, you know, that's what it's talking about, purging it. Uh, I've seen them take, uh, you know, a fruit tree and cut, a, cut down a dead branch, and next thing you know, you got two, three, four branches growing out of that, that uh, nub. And that gives you more fruit, right? Verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Is this talking about the lake of fire? Verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love, if, I, F, if, ye keep my commandments. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Now, can you imagine these churches that preach pure, pure grace, and they say, oh, well, you know, we don't have to keep the law because it was nailed to the cross. Well, what is Jesus saying here? If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Now, I know I've mentioned this many times in the past, but uh, in Matthew 22 and verse 36, somebody asked Jesus a question. Master, which is the same word as rabbi. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All right, so, you know, we don't need ten commandments. Christ made it the two commandment. Two commandments, love the Lord and love thy neighbor. And like I've said many times, 
Uh, I hope you don't live next door to a bunch of Satanists. Uh, let's see. Now, in John 13, 14, Jesus gives us a new commandment. So we got not only the two commandments, but we got three of them. John 13, 34, Jesus speaking. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Hmm, okay. Let's go back to John chapter 15, uh, back to verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Huh. And boy, I've preached this at many a funeral. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if, if ye do whatsoever I command you. And didn't Christ lay down his life for his friends, for us? Oh yeah, sure did. That, my friends, is the gospel. Verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, you see, people, God has a chosen people. <laughs> but the thing is, they don't want you to know it's believers in Christ. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So, we're supposed to ask of the Father in the name of who? Yeshua HaMashiach? Maybe that's why they want you to use that name. Because maybe the Father will say, uh, who's that? Who's Yeshua HaMashiach? You see, the New Testament was written in Greek. And my Bible, which was translated from Greek into English, says Jesus. So... Whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of this world, but I have chosen you, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. See, what they're, what he's saying here is uh, keeping his sayings. They're going to try to use your words against you. But all these things they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. In other words, their sin has no covering. It's like they go to the wedding and they don't have on a wedding garment. Ooh, that's going to be bad news, right? Verse 23. He that hateth me hateth my father also. And who is it that hates Jesus? Uh, there is one group in the world that hates Jesus. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, well, look up Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9. Verse 24. 
if I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. Now, what, do you, what kind of works did Jesus do? He made the deaf to hear. He made the blind to see. He made, he cast out devils. He brought the dead back to life. Okay, now there were prophets in the Old Testament that had done some of those things. I mean, he, he had cured lepers. I mean, did all kinds of stuff. Now, there were prophets in the Old Testament that had done, you know, maybe maybe cleansed a leper, maybe brought somebody back to life, um, but nobody, but nobody had done all those miracles and healings like Christ did. Christ did them all. Christ did them all. I mean, one of the prophets might have done one, but Christ did all those miracles. I mean... He made the lame to walk. I mean, please, you know. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. You know, it kills me. You, I've been to Pentecostal churches, and their, their, their main focus is always on, oh, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. But... The Bible, you know, Christ said, um, he shall testify of me. If the Holy Spirit doesn't testify of Christ and what he did on the cross, the shedding of his blood and the resurrection, it's a false spirit, in my opinion. Verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. All right, let's take a look at the book of Jude. Of course, Jude is one chapter, so chapter 1, verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old. Ooh, boy, there's a, that's a sermon right there. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Did you know there, there were people of old condemned, <laughs> ordained to condemnation? Ungodly men, turning the grace of, our, uh, grace of our God into lasciviousness. You know what lasciviousness means? Gross sin. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel 
when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring about him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, twice dead. How, how can you be twice dead? Well, the body, and I guess the spirit, right? Twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Boy, that word ungodly is used a lot there, huh? These are murmurers, complainers. Yeah, instead of being thankful for what the Lord gave them, they're complaining about what the Lord didn't give them. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there, would be, there should be mockers in the last time. Who should walk after their own ungodly lusts? Oh yeah, go to San Francisco. Yeah. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. Do you know there's churches in San Francisco that'll uh, use an NIV Bible and, and tell you that God made them uh, sodomites, God, uh, gay? Yeah, they'll actually tell you that God made them that way. And, you know, and if you're in a committed sodomite relationship, uh, you're blessed. And they absolutely believe this. They Seriously, they do. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and and ever. Amen. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, I did a Bible study on these 24 elders. And personally, I think it's uh, 12 of them were the patriarchs for the 12 tribes. And the other 12, I think, are the apostles, minus 
Judas Iscariot plus Paul. But, hey, that's just my opinion. Uh, let's see. Verse 5. And out of the throne proceedeth, proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire. Seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And if memory serves me correctly, these were the four standards of the armies of Israel, if if memory serves me correctly. All right. Um, yeah, there were uh, like standards. A standard was like a flag, a battle flag. I, I think I read something about this in the Old Testament. Maybe one day I'll go into more detail if I could find it. Verse 8, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and, and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, why would they say, Holy, holy, holy? Why say that three times? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's, that's how I look at it. Now, um, Man was made in God's image, and man has a body, man has a spirit, man has a soul. Well, and that goes for you ladies, too. But uh, we're three parts, one person in three parts. So, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, right? Verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever... The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Even the devil, people, was created to show forth his glory, I suppose. I mean, that's how I see it. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 8. I would like to finish this series, this study, but these uh, long studies, they take a long time for my computer to convert them from an audio file to a video file. All right, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And guess what, people? The seventh trumpet is the last trump. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire, and filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Yeah, there's going to be an earthquake that's going to remove all the mountains and the islands. That's, uh, that's going to be a whole lot of shaking going on. Little Richard. Verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. I did a Bible series on this on the plagues of Egypt contrasted with the plagues of Revelation. This is almost exactly what happened in Egypt. The first angel sounded, and there were and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees 
was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire, with fire, was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, just a little something. Scientists say that the Pacific Ocean by itself is one-third of all the water on the earth. So if this great mountain that was burning was cast into the Pacific and it died and did what it, we just read, that would fulfill the prophecy. Uh, but I'm not saying that's exactly what it is, but I'm just pointing out that the uh, Pacific is supposed to be one-third of all the water on the earth. Uh, World War II veterans uh, who fought in the Pacific, whether in the air or on the ocean, said that the Pacific Ocean is vast, huge. I mean, it's just, you could go a thousand miles in any direction and not see anything. I mean, it was huge. So, all right. Uh, now, there's a group of people that call themselves preterists, and they'll say that the, the book of Revelation is all past. All this has already happened. Uh, when did this happen? I, you know, re history doesn't record a third of the world or the oceans turning in the blood and all the creatures and the ships being destroyed and, and all dying. Uh, where, where's this in history? You know, so, you know, people, now there's, there's a, they take a little bit of truth and they'll carry it to the extreme. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had to spend years studying this stuff just to separate the, the truth from the lies. And I'm not saying I got it all figured out. I don't. Um, you know, every time I do a Bible study or re do some reading or listening, I, I find something new. You know, but uh, I'm sorry. Revelation is not all past and it hasn't all come true yet. So, I don't know. Verse 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning, burning, as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so that the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Um, that's not been recorded in history yet, to my knowledge. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. I mean, things are bad. And you got three more angels getting ready to sound. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 11. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's uh, three and a half years, roughly. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now, the Bible says that Elijah will be one of these two witnesses. Some people say Moses is the other because of the trans, who appeared unto Jesus at the transfiguration. Others say that it's Enoch. But uh, one of them is going to be Elijah. And they shall prophesy a 
1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. And that's roughly 40 and two months. Verse four, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, it doesn't mean their mouth, they're going to open their mouth and it's going to turn into a flamethrower. No, 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 no. Elijah was, um, had some soldiers that came to arrest him for the wicked king Ahab. And he said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and devour thee and thy 50. And I'm paraphrasing. And fire came down from heaven and burned up the captain and his 50 troops. Yeah, there was 50 guys to arrest this one prophet. And they all burned up. So he opened his mouth and fire came out. Well, not out of his mouth, but he opened his mouth and fire came down and destroyed them. So, but the, uh, the false prophet is also going to have this same type of power. And that makes an interesting study in and of itself. I've covered that in other, other studies. You can read that on, take a look at my playlist, you know. So, verse 6. These have power to shut heaven. The two witnesses, just like Elijah did in the days of Ahab. Three and a half years, it didn't rain. Not one drop in Israel. Not one drop. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So there's going to be seven years, a seven year time period. For three and a half years, these witnesses are going to confront the beast, the false prophet, the man of sin, whatever you, you know, son of perdition, whatever you want to call him. And then when these two witnesses are done, they're going to be killed. And that's when things get really, really bad. And then the, uh, I believe that's when, if my timelines are correct, uh, that's when the Antichrist will sit in the temple proclaiming himself that he is God. And basically, that's when all hell on earth is going to break loose. So, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. What's the great city where our Lord was crucified, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt? Well, if you don't know where the Lord was crucified, uh, he wasn't crucified in Rome. He wasn't crucified in New York City. He wasn't crucified in Mecca. And he wasn't crucified in Istanbul. Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. You see, these prophets are going to be preaching in Jerusalem. Verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer or allow, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of God, I'm sorry, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a loud voice from saying, I'm sorry, from heaven, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, just like Jesus did, right? Jesus went up into heaven in a cloud, right? And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in 
the earthquake were slain of men, 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Oh yeah, there's going to be a remnant in Jerusalem that are going to give glory to the God of heaven. Verse 14, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, ooh, the last trump, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Did you know that God's going to destroy those that destroy the earth? Oh yeah, God's an environmentalist. You didn't know that, huh? And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. All right, let's go to Revelation 13. I have beat this horse so many times, but um, it's part of the series, so let's do it again. Boy, this is, yeah, I, I've read this chapter so many times. Uh, Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. He's trying to be like the lion of the tribe of Judah, but I don't think so. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon. Ah, I did a series on this. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Boy, that, that the forty-two and two months, that, that that's, uh, you know... Word association in the King James Bible, that's how you can tell when things go together. Forty and two months. All right. We just read about forty and two months, didn't we? Not too long ago. Oh, yeah. Verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship, worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Do you know, the way I read this, there are people whose names are not written in the book of life. I mean, if your name's not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, does this sound like everybody's got a chance at salvation? You know, I, I don't know. It looks like some people's names are written in the book of life and others mm, doesn't look like it, does it? I mean, that's how I, I look at this. Verse 9, if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. 
You know, people, if we are to go into captivity uh, for our faith in Christ, we're to do so willingly. Somebody wants to kill your family because they don't like your skin color, by all means, protect your family by any means necessary. Jesus said, let he that hath no sword sell his coat and buy one. Oh, yeah. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast come coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was heal, healed. And he doeth great wonders, false miracles, people. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. See, this, this false uh, prophet here is going to make fire come down from heaven, just like Elijah did. Matter of fact, don't be surprised if there are two Elijahs running around, one the true and one the false. Verse 14, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And if you don't think Satan can do miracles and control the weather and what have you, I suggest you read Job chapter 1. I mean, I we could do it, but... I've done, I've done Job uh, quite a bit. All right, so he's going to make an image of the beast. Verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would, would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I always think of television when I see the uh, image of the beast, beast speaking. Uh, but that's just my opinion. Verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let, he, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Six, six, six. Adam, man, was created on the sixth day. And I tell you what, people, if, if there is, uh, if this is a microchip of some sort, now, you know, your credit cards, your ATM cards, your debit cards, um, and your driver's licenses for, as far as I know, most states, if not all, uh, they all have chips in them. I mean, your government identification, and your um, your bank cards. I mean, suppose they merged your government ID with your banking information, and instead of having a chip in a card that could be lost or stolen, suppose they put it in your right hand or in your forehead, and then scan you know scanned it with computers and stuff. I mean, you wouldn't be able to buy or sell without it. You know, it it just, it fits. You know, I mean, I took computer science and electronics, uh, computer science and business in college, and, um, and I took electronics in vocational school. And I tell you what, I look at this, and I'm not saying I'm right, but it just, it fits. Like a glove. It really does. All right, let's take a look. Let's keep going. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. Verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred, forty, and four thousand, having their father's name written in their foreheads. I think I would rather have the father's name written in my forehead over the uh, mark of the beast, but hey, that's just my opinion. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as 
it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Well, that excludes me. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And ladies, just a note, it doesn't mean that because they touched women, they were defiled. No. But there are those that figured they would serve the Lord 100% instead of serving their own fleshly lusts. And um, let's face it, you know, if you... Uh, if you get married, uh, you got you got to take care of the wife and the family. I mean, that's just the way it, it works. Uh, that means God's a part-time job because the family is, uh, you got to provide for them. But there are people that want to serve God with all their heart and not be distracted by fleshly lusts. Now, it doesn't mean that because they touch women, they were defiled. No, that's not how I find it. So, uh, let's see. I mean, after all, Peter was married, you know. Yeah, uh, according to the Catholic Church, the first pope was married. Well, according to them. Being first fruits unto the God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Why does it say Babylon is fallen, is fallen? One time physical, one time, another time spiritual, maybe. I don't know. That's how I look at it. Um, Babylon physically fell thousands of years ago. Spiritually, it'll fall when the Lord destroys it. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. In other words, it's going to be full strength, industrial strength, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. What's indignation? Extreme hatred. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire, fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Does this mean that they're going to have eternal torment in the flames? Uh, that's kind of how I look at it. I mean, you know, the, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. See, just because you keep the commandments, that means nothing if you don't have the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, 
that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Oh yeah, this is harvest. Read the parable of the wheat and the tares, people. This is, this is the fulfillment of that. And he that sat on the cloud, oh, I did a, a, a playlist on uh, the wheat and the tares. Oh yeah. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. How would you like to be a grape in the winepress of the wrath of God? Uh, no thanks. I think I'll pass. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress, even unto the hot horses, even unto the horse bridles. A bridle of a horse, that's like the, the, um, the saddle. I think that's the, the bottom of the saddle. Now, how, how tall is a horse uh, where the, the top of his legs? I mean, you're talking a couple, maybe two, three feet. A meter, perhaps? You know? That's a lot of blood, people. Even on the horse's bridle by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. I'm not sure exactly what a furlong is, but uh, sounds like a lot. All right, everybody. I was hoping to finish, but uh, there's just, you know, it's almost been an hour. And uh, I want to cover... Some of this might actually happen in our lifetime, perhaps. I'm not sure. I know people have been saying the second coming for almost 2,000 years, but things are getting real. But I also want to cover the, um, the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ. And uh, there's going to be... Uh, there's going to be something happen that's pretty magnificent at the end of the thousand year millennium of Christ. The second resurrection, um, the white throne judgment, um, and uh, where somebody gets cast into, into the lake of fire. So, all right, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, in Jesus' precious name, amen.